Okay, so recording is on. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening based on your time zone. Um, thank you very much for joining today. With um, Today's webinar is uh, a free web webinar for all of you, and we are very uh, honored and fortunate to have Dr. Bashu Naziruddin here with us. He's going to give a talk on novel treatment for type 1 diabetes. And he'll be telling us um, what are the current treatments for diabetes, uh, the success of islet transplantation, uh, future strategies to cure diabetes. Um, he'll be giving us a lot of details today. Uh, this talk is a result of a collaboration between STEM Matters and Young Professionals Society. Uh, STEM Matters, uh, we have a vision to enable students to innovate, invent, and deliver quality solutions to contemporary challenges. And our mission is to inspire students to excel in the areas of science, technology, engineering, and environment matters by nurturing their critical and analytical thinking skills. Our objectives are to nurture highly functioning teams to work together and create scientifically sound innovative solutions to the world's complex problems. And we want to create a community of young innovators trained in problem solving skills. We want to develop high level scientific programs to provide an international forum for scientific contact to learn, collaborate, and compete for meritorious outcomes. We want to empower students with the skill sets, for example, research, programming, leadership, and others to make them competitive in the higher education and mar marketplace. And last but not the least, we want to involve uh, underprivileged youth in science, technology, engineering, and environment matters as well. We, just, we don't want to ignore anyone. And our sister organization, based off of UK, Young Professional Society, is set up to help support and change the lives of youth by providing personal and professional development opportunities. It aims to bring to the forefront a more progressive, accomplished, and enlightened younger generation of people who will be representatives and leaders of their communities and who will contribute positively towards the wider society. So our wonderful, amazing speaker today, uh, Dr. Bashu Naziruddin, He's a professor and director at Baylor's Simmons Transplant Institute. His current research includes immunobiology of human islet cell transplantation, development of an optimal immunosuppressive regimen for islet transplantation, st and strategies to include tolerance towards donor islets, and identification of novel drugs to prevent islet rejection. So we are very Honor, very privileged and fortunate to have Dr. Naziruddin with us. Uh, Dr. Naziruddin, thank you very much for joining. Uh, we would love to hear today um, some, some amazing things about the research that you're doing. So over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Brother Shaquille, and also Dr. Samir Iqbal for your kind invitation to, to uh, address this uh, uh, STEM students and STEM gathering. And um, uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are joining for, for us uh, uh, on this uh, occasion. Uh, again, my title of the talk is Pancreatic Islet Transplantation. It is a novel and also a promising treatment for type 1 diabetes. Uh, when you hear the title, you may be sometimes a little bit surprised or even shocked. Well, what is this uh, islet transplantation? People generally talk about uh, in a disease or a thing, but I, I estimate the, the intelligence of STEM students really high. So I want to, uh, based on uh, just now, Brother Shakil has uh, illustrated what is the objective of STEM. It is to not only um, to encourage science, but also provoke thinking, critical thinking. That is very important. So in this presentation, I'm going to give you a little bit of a bird's eye view of this, uh, this technology, but there is lots of information that you can critically think and challenge yourself and even ask me questions. So I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, so just a little bit about myself. Uh, I am basically from uh, India. Uh, I uh, graduated uh, from south part of India called the University of Madras. I did my BS in chemistry, then MS in biochemistry, PhD in biochemistry. And I was fortunate to come to United States in 1987. And initially, I was at Oklahoma City. I worked on a disease called cystic fibrosis. Uh, uh, it is still it's a rare disorder, but uh, uh, of course, it is still a challenge to, to cure. 
Then in 1990, I moved to Washington University School of Medicine because I was very passionate about transplantation. I always wanted to use science to make a difference in people's life. See, if you look at scientists, some of them may spend their entire life working on a gene or working on a mouse, cure that, but I am a little bit more at the forefront. I want to see a, what is called a bench to bedside approach. If I, if I see something in the lab, can I apply to, uh, to cure a disease or make a difference in a person's life? This treatment that I'm talking today, pancreatic islet transplantation is that, where a, a student can go in the lab and uh, do some tests and then they can really make a difference in a, a type one diabetic patient's life. So the, I'm more interested into applied uh, science part of it. And I also worked in a company called Baxter Healthcare where we actually uh, attempted to genetically engineer pig for transplant. I will just give a little bit of that information at the end of this talk. But then I joined Baylor in Dallas in 2003 as a director of Island Cell Laboratory. I am currently a professor at uh, Baylor University Waco Institute of Biomedical Studies. And I've also mentored several graduate students and postdocs uh, in the research. So that's about uh, my, uh, my background. And then when it comes to the overview of what we will talk today is, I'll quickly walk through uh, uh, the process of islet cell transplantation. What is it and how long it's been going on and what are the current results? What are the challenges? We'll go through that quickly. And then in the end, there's plenty of opportunity for STEM uh, uh, discussion and opportunity and talk, uh, discussion and question and answers. So, um, what is diabetes? As I think many of you who really, uh, I, I, everybody must be familiar with this disease called diabetes. I, as such, in the whole world, there are about 25.8 million children with type 1 diabetes and uh, even more uh, actually uh, with, with type 2 diabetes. What is type 1? What is type 2? If, it's, if a diabetic situation, what is diabetes, first of all? Diabetes is if a person has a very high amount of glucose in their blood, then it is called a diabetic state. So when some children develop diabetes, when at the age of six, 10, 12, then it's characterized as type one diabetes. And then whereas when people develop diabetes at the later age, like 25, 30 year old, they are becoming they are a little bit fat and they are inactive, they develop that, that's called type two diabetes. In the whole world, about 90% of the patients are type two diabetes and less than 10 are type one diabetes. There is another thing called gestational diabetes. It is, be, uh, it is like when some women, when they go through the pregnancy, they develop a disease, uh, diabetes, and that's called gestational diabetes. We'll talk about it, uh, the first uh, aspect, that is the uh, type 1 diabetes. You may ask, well, the blood glucose goes high, so what? So what happens? Well, if the a normal blood glucose uh, in, a, in a normal healthy individual is somewhere between 80 milligrams or up to 100 milligrams, but after you eat a heavy meal of biryani or some, you know, some sweets, it may go up to like 140, 150, but it should come back to 100 or always normal. But then if, if your glucose levels go high and always stay high, like around 200 or more, what happens is like down the line after several years, people experience nephropathy. That means their kidney function will be gone. They uh, develop retinopathy. That means uh, they become blind and vascular disease, they may experience strokes or heart disease and things like that. So diabetes is not something that you can live with uh, without doing anything about it. So what do people do? If you are a type one diabetic, I'll tell you what it is. It is a genetic disorder where the entire uh, insulin production uh, in the body is gone. There is no insulin production, which means that they have to have insulin injection to survive. For example, if you take a type one diabetic patient, put them in an island, then Technically, without insulin, they can't even survive. Uh, you know, uh, so it is that day that is important to have insulin injection. Whereas type two diabetic people have enough insulin, but they they can survive on taking medication and things like that. So again, as you, I'm telling you, insulin injection, oral medication, you have to take daily. What if you say, can I not have anything? Can I have a cure? Is there a way to cure? Well, islet transplantation that I'm talking today is one of one such thing. That is. It is a cure uh, for diabetes. Just to give you one uh, minute of what is type one diabetes, like when some people, when they have some genetic predisposition, they call, and if you look at the left side uh, of the bar, it's called islet mass. A normal person, say 100% of the islets are working, 
But in a type 1 diabetic patient, uh, 75, 80% of the islets are lost and before they re re recognize that, okay, this patient has become diabetes. All I'm trying to say is that it, it is usually diagnosed at a very advanced stage where there is not much you can do. So in terms of cure, what are all the four options is one, if they, a person can have a pancreas transplantation, I'll tell you what it is in the next slide. And you can have islet cell transplantation. In, in future, people are thinking about using pig islets or even stem cells. So we will talk about it just in the end. So as you can see in this slide, there is an organ called pancreas. It is right in the middle of the stomach, just below your liver. Uh, and it does two things. One, this pancreas makes enzymes to digest your food. And it also makes insulin to, to control blood glucose. So if, you, if your type 1 diabetic patient has no insulin, the right thing to do is replace the pancreas. You know, the pancreas is not working, put in a new one. But unfortunately, it is not so easy because the, the pancreas uh, surgery, a transplant is a major surgery. You cannot do it uh, in a normal uh, condition. So you, it is a very serious uh, surgical procedure and many people don't prefer to do it. So what is islet transplantation? It's shown in this is that uh, in the pancreas, there are several islands or islets uh, of, uh, of the cells scattered throughout the organ. Their job is to make insulin. So technologically, if you're able to get those islet cells out of the pancreas, make a solution, inject it, then technically that will solve the problem because if they will make insulin, the patient is happy. So that is our process. So what we are doing here is, uh, is, is we, I'm showing you a cross section of pancreas. That is, if I take a human pancreas, make a section out of it, just a cross section, and then look into the inside, you'll see these islet cells, uh, which are all sitting in the middle. So this is like the microscopic slide of that. You may ask, how do we do this transplant? Where, where do I get it? If I'm a type of diabetic person, what should I do? So in our lab, or many labs in the world, we identify a disease donor, that is they are brain dead, but they're not actually dead. So what we do is they procure liver, kidneys for transplant. We get a pancreas from such donors, bring it to the lab. We will have a, we have a technically uh, advanced procedure where we extract these cells. And then once the cells are extracted, we inject into the, into the recipient. Uh, that means the type one diabetic patient. So once the injection is done, the islets go into the liver, they start working. So this type 1 diabetic patient now has his own or her own insulin producing cell, I mean insulin producing cells. So that is the concept. Then you may ask, what, why do you have to have this procedure? The simple thing is, it is a very minimally invasive procedure. Like I was saying, pancreas is a major surgery, whereas this one is just an injection. You go to the uh, uh, hospital, uh, they will admit you and then uh, attach a cannula or catheter in your body and then you will be awake. There is no anesthesia. You, I mean, local anesthesia is there just for the injection. You will be awake, you'll be talking, the cells go in your body. In a matter of 30 minutes or 45 minutes, the cells are in, and you just go home, uh, same day. So, you know, if, for a type of diabetic patient, this is like an amazing uh, dream come true kind of treatment. But the, the results are also very good because a patient, if the islets work very well, they don't need any more insulin, they don't need any more medication. So they have a much better life. You may ask, is this something new? You call it novel? Unfortunately, it is not really that novel. Way back in last century, in 1893 itself in Europe, people have attempted to do island transplantation, but it has been evolved over a period of more than 100 years. And now uh, we have finally, there are select centers in the United States that you see here where this island transplantation is offered. Like for example, you see Texas, we have Dallas, Fort Worth. There is one center in Houston, in California, they have two. And in UK, United Kingdom, they have a, a consortium. There are several centers that join together and then offer this. In fact, the United Kingdom, the government has recognized this procedure, they even fund it. The insurance is covering that uh, the procedure. Well, the, in, in Dallas, our lab is situated near the downtown in a hospital called Baylor University Medical Center Hospital. And you see a, a building and what you see is the, a view of what is a, an islet cell lab looks like. And the, the important thing that you need to understand is that uh, this procedure must be done under the guidance of Food and Drug Administration. 
Food and Drug Administration is an agency that really regulates how you operate the lab, the facility, the product, and everything. So he, here is a, a, a schematic of how we, we, we take the pancreas and make islands. What we do is, uh, like I said, when there is a brain dead donor, we go get the pancreas, we bring it to the lab, we go through the isolation process. And then one thing I want to tell you, if I take a pancreas and then make cells out of it, only 5% are islet cells. The rest 95% are enzyme making acinal cells. So what we do is we, we, we get the cells, we purify them, and then we take it to the, uh, uh, to the uh, interventional radiology lab where they, where they inject the cells. Uh, this is just a, a picture of how the operation takes place. This is the starting point. And uh, you can see in the middle, a pancreas is, is a really live uh, uh, image of one of the, um, the pancreas. We bring it to the lab. And in the lab, we just inject a, a solution called enzyme solution. And what it, this enzyme does is it, it digests the pancreas into small pieces. And you can see here, we, I, once the enzyme is in, I cut the pancreas into small pieces. We just uh, put it into a chamber and digest. What is important is that you see here, uh, within 30 minutes, the pancreas you saw in the previous slide is in the form of a solution. The whole thing is in liquid now. So from the liquid, we go through a purification process where uh, in a matter of 10, 15 minutes, we just purify the islets. What you see on the left side is the red dots are the islet cells. And then what you see on the right side is the more red dot. That means it's more uh, purified or purified preparation. So once this is done, we put the islets in a bag. As you can see here, this is a typical plastic bag containing about 200 ml of solution. That's it. We take a solution, go to the intervention radiology. As you can see here as uh, the patients, uh, that, like I said, this is a type 1 diabetic patient who has been selected for this procedure. This patient is lying down and then the radiologist is talking to them and we are the transplant people and we also talk to them. So what the radiologist does is he puts a catheter or a small plastic tube into the liver. The arrow mark shows that is where the islets go in. And once uh, the radiologist accesses this particular part of the liver, we let the islets go in just through gravity. We just leave them, the solution goes through slowly and then they lodge. So you may ask, well, you put in some cells into this person's liver, how, how are they going to work? How are they going to, going to last for a long time? So, well, to protect the islets uh, from, you know, our body uh, has been created to defend itself from external things. For example, a virus, when it comes to inside our body, we, we defend it. Our body has a special system called immune system, which has got cells that defend the, against the virus. Same thing against bacteria. Now, the islets are foreign to this body. So once you put the islets in the liver, again, our body has to defend it. So we defend this. And so to defend it, what we do is we, uh, we this by defense mechanism, uh, our body may even reject those islet cells, destroy them. To protect from that such a destruction, we use a medication called immunosuppression. Once you give the immunosuppression, the islets are kind of protected. So they don't get uh, you know, rejected by the body. So now what we do is, uh, okay, uh, here is a, uh, sorry, let's just say. Okay, you can see here, you are talking about this process, you have given the eyelash to your patient, can they see some results? I'm showing you the results on three patients here. On the left side, you see the blood glucose level in the, in the patient. It is called fasting blood glucose level. Anybody with diabetes usually, usually, they wake up in the morning, look at the blood glucose level. You can see on the left side, their blood glucose was very high in the beginning, but as time goes on, like 300, 400 days, their glucose levels are very controlled. If you see on the right side, see this patient was taking insulin about 30, 35, 40 units a day. But then after the islets are injected once, that's called the first transplant, day zero. And then we can give one more injection if it's necessary. Once you give second, then this patient takes zero insulin per day. That means they can have a normal life, eat normal food, as long as they take the immunosuppression, they are fine. They don't need insulin injection. They don't need any of that. So if you see the second patient, it is even longer. Currently in our center, we have a patient who has been insulin independent for eight years, insulin free. 
So this is the really a good result that I can show you. And the next one is uh, the results. You know, this is just a summary of what we have done. We have done about 17 patients, 27 transplant. But the important thing is 12 out of the 17 patients have achieved complete insulin independence. The rest five have less insulin requirement, but the life is a lot more better. So that is the summary. But then you may ask, what are the pros and cons? You know, there's always an advantage, disadvantage. The disadvantage is the immunosuppression people have to take as long as they want the islets to work. That means instead of insulin, now they're taking immunosuppression tablets. But then also this procedure is expensive. Like in the United States, it may cost you like $200,000 to have two islet transplants. So that's an expensive procedure. So then you may ask, where are we going? Because also I was, sorry, I was going to tell you one more thing. There is a shortage of organ. For example, in the United States alone, there are about 1.5 million or more uh, diabetics. But are there that many pancreases? Are there 2 million pancreases for transplant? No, we don't have that. We have probably a few hundred or probably a few thousand uh, organs. So that means there's a huge shortage. So to overcome that, you may, you may not like this pig, uh, but uh, if you look at the, uh, the structure of insulin, human and pig, there is only one amino acid different. There are 99.99% similar. So that means a pig insulin will work as good as in human. So which means if I put pig islets into human, that will be working fine too. So we are doing some research on can we use that. The reason is once you use these pig islets, there is plenty. You can, you can throw the world anywhere in, in the world. Uh, we can deliver the islet producing, I mean, islets uh, you know, uh, from pigs that can cure type 1 diabetes. And also, you might have heard a word called stem cells. In a, in a, in a human body, there are specific cells. This is for like, you know, you're your stem students, so you should know a little bit about stem cells. So the stem cells is like, you know, in a, in a human body, there are cells which constantly uh, progress and divide and differentiate into various parts of the body. Like some of them become bone marrow cells, some of them become nerve cells, some of them become heart muscle cells, some of them become islet cells. If you're able to identify those stem cells, culture them in a flask, we should be able to produce enough insulin producing cells to cure diabetes. So that's a challenge. So to summarize what I was telling you, that it is a, it's a viable option to treat brittle diabetics. You may ask, what is the big advantage? See, currently a type 1 diabetic patient can have an insulin pump attached. You know, in their belly, there's a pump which constantly injects insulin. And there is another device called glucose meter, which constantly measures glucose. They communicate with each other and they can, they can communicate. But unfortunately, if there is a mechanical problem, if the pump injects a lot of insulin, then the patient will have low glucose level that may result in death. So there is an issue, whereas the islet cells that we give, they are biological. When there is too much glucose, they'll give insulin. When there is too less glucose, they will not make insulin. So it is a, it is a better thing. So this is a simple process. It looks uh, from this presentation, but it is technologically very advanced. Okay. And uh, I, I'm just giving you, this is, this procedure takes a big team, a team of surgeons, a team of islet specialists to do this. So that's about the pancreatic islet transplantation. Now I want to open up and ask, challenge you guys, like, you know, you may ask, what is in it for STEM students? I am like a ninth grader or a 10th grader. I am interested in science and technology. I want to know what is it that I can do to contribute? How can I join? Or is there something challenging? Yes, there are several challenges. Number one, there are patients uh, with diabetes. Actually, the number of patients in the whole world is growing. If you're an Asian, like you know, you're from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, or you are from an African country, or even for that matter, if you're Hispanic, like if you're from Mexico or Southern, the number of diabetic patients is growing very, very alarming rate. So that is one thing. People can see why it is growing. Is there a genetic predisposition that we can analyze? Students can work on population genetics, try to find out why this is growing. The next is artificial pancreas. I just talked to you. You can have an insulin pump and glucose monitor. Can they communicate, deliver thing? And now I was telling you stem cells. Now there is technology where I can take a single cell and then look what are the genetic factors that are acting, are activated, are, are working. We can look at that. 
again, can we de deduct diabetes at the early stage so that we can stop the destruction? That is the important thing. And for type two diabetic, like you may you you may have somebody in your relative or a friend whose uh, parents are type one type type two diabetic, can we give them uh, a better medication? So these are the things that you can always think about. And then there is also data analytics that we can do. There are so many research opportunities. My lab, every year we take two students who can come into the lab. They can look into what we do. We can even look into a transplant procedure and, and see how they can get excited about this uh, research. So what I'll do is I'll stop here and uh, I'm open to questions because I was told it's a 30 minute talk. So I'm, 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 fin I'm, fin I'm finishing like three minutes ahead. Wonderful, Dr. I think that was very, very good. Um, very interesting. Um, a lot of questions, um, hopefully. Um, so uh, I would uh, ask the audience, if you have questions, you can unmute yourself or you can type in the chat window uh, your questions and I can ask for you uh, however you want to ask the questions. So it's your choice. Um, let me see if on Facebook if we got any questions. In the meantime, folks on the Zoom, please let let me know, or let Dr. Nazir Nazir know if you have any questions. I encourage the students to to ask questions because I'm sure uh, uh, either you understood everything or you understood nothing. Then then only you cannot ask questions. If you have understood part of it, definitely have questions. Feel free. Actually, it's very important to have a very nice discussion. So one question, uh, Dr. Nazirudin, what is uh, immunosuppression? Okay, immunosuppression, like I was telling, uh, in a human body, there are uh, a system called immune system. What it does is it protects uh, uh, our body from invading pathogens, like, you know, virus, bacteria. So this immune system, once the islets are inside, will activate, will destroy. Uh, so what immunosuppression does is, it, it is a drug which specifically go into the immune cells. For example, there is a cell called T cell or a B cell. T as in like in thymus, uh, B as in like bursa, they call it. So T and B cells, these drugs will go inside that cell, inhibit its function. Now the T cells and B cell will not attack the islets. So you may ask, then what happens to the virus and bacteria? Well, this patient will be immune compromised. So immunosuppression protects the islets, but makes the patient susceptible to, to foreign uh, agent or foreign attacks. And does it uh, express anything which uh, is kind of uh, beneficial for the body or useful for the body, or it just only expresses, uh, I mean, does the only surgical kind of uh, operation? Uh, which one, which part you're talking about? Which one is the, the immunosuppression drug? Yeah, yeah. The, the immunosuppression. For example, whenever a patient receives transplant, kidney, liver, you got to have a, a immunosuppression. For example, some patients develop autoimmune disease. You know, autoimmune disease is like I don't know whether any one of you heard what is called a systemic lupus erythematosus called SLE and all. What it does is in under certain circumstances, our body starts recognizing our own cells and attacks it. So immunosuppression in that condition protects our body, protects our, uh, uh, you know, the cells that we need to have function. So immunosuppression can help not only in transplant, but also in autoimmune diseases. On the other hand, if you look at a cancer patient, in the cancer patient, you want more activation of immunosuppression, I mean, immuno, immune cells, because cancer grows in your body without the immune cells recognizing it. But if you're able to activate the immune system, it will recognize the cancer and kill it. So that is the job of the immune system too. So in cancer, we want the immune system to activate. In transplant, we want the immune system to be suppressed. Right. Another question, uh, why are Asians more prone to diabetes? Is it due, more, due to more uh, genetics or diet related or what is the reason? See, it is a combination of everything. For example, people have done uh, analysis of what is called an HLA analysis. They, they looked at the genes of patients from, let's say, South India is one of the highest uh, population of patients with diabetes. So they looked at the genetics. There are some genes that are found in this population which 
are more in diabetic patient than non diabetic so that is number one that is a but there is no 100% proof that it is but it is a, it's a association study then number two uh, diet if you look at all the asian and the uh, population they take more carbohydrate like rice based food and then that is number two the third is lack of exercise in order for us to digest uh, or utilize glucose in the body you have to have an active lifestyle you need to do exercise so that is maybe lacking in this population so it is a combination of everything food lifestyle and um, great dr zidin we got one question from facebook um the person is asking my son is 5 years old what is the recommended age of an islet transplant recipient is your is the is that pay, per son diagnosed with diabetes seems like yes okay so uh, actually uh, i uh, if you look at technical wise islets can be beneficial even for a child but the immunosuppression that we give uh, like i i mentioned two names called tecrolimus and sirolimus these drugs are not really um, you know normal drugs they are very little bit difficult drugs so the fda has recommended not to give uh, these drugs to small children like 5 year old 6 year old and all so currently the patient has to be 18 and above for uh, for consideration uh, for islet transplantation 18 and above okay the other question is uh, uh, are are they doing regenerative medicine work on islets any research going on on that absolutely i i, I mentioned to you uh, regenerative medicine for example if you look into the slides there is a, 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 a you can see the stem cells can you just just hold on for a second uh, okay so if you look into this uh, stem cells uh, it is regenerative medicine for example i can take bone marrow from my own body and isolate a specific type of cells and then add certain drugs you stimulate them to become uh, beta cells insulin producing so that's called regenerative medicine so yes there are research going on in regenerative medicine very good thank you for that uh, next question is is it possible to visit you and your lab seems very promising area that's interesting yes sir. can you can you repeat the question please so the question is, is is it possible to see you or visit you and your lab absolutely my lab has been open for the last 17 years every year we take uh, at least two students you may ask why only two uh, as i was telling you my lab has a huge uh, uh, restriction on uh, regulatory burden it's a fda regulator even to enter the lab you need to have uh, uh, access granted and all so uh, and also the cells that we deal with have may have some viruses so you got to be careful so what we do is we screen the students we uh, uh, test them for everything immunization record everything if they all fit in then we let two students to come in and then they go inside the lab and then we can do the uh, 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 the training and they can watch but if there are a group of like 10 students they want to tour the lab and in one day i can open up the lab have everybody come and see what we do we can demonstrate show some videos and things like that very right. thank you dr nazir uh, another question on facebook can you describe any instance where the immunosuppressants did not work in case of uh, this islet transplantation uh, what were the consequences and does the hospital perform the checks that immunosuppressants would work in any patient before their administration i heard recently a case where for some organ transplant immunosuppressants did not work and the patient died very good it's a, it's a very good question see we call this immunosuppression as a double edged sword on one side the immunosuppression can protect uh, i mean can inhibit the t cells and b cells on the other hand they may be toxic to certain things for example the kidney can be affected by this immunosuppression so what we do is in islet transplant patient every day or every third day we draw the blood look at the concentration of uh, prograf which is a, a tecrolimus it should be like 6 nanogram or 6 uh, nanogram so if it is 6 nanogram it is working optimally if it is uh, if the patient did not take the medication it goes to like 1 or 2 that mean the immunosuppression is failing or sometime the 
the uh, patient takes more, then what happens is like, you know, that also destroys the kidney. So yes, there are cases where an immunosuppression can fail. It is not a 100% safe mechanism. You have to be very careful. The, the, the transplant surgeon watch it very carefully, the doses and how effective they are. Great. Thank you for this detailed question, Dr. Naziruddin. Another question is what type one incidence is increasing? Why type one is increasing? Yeah, type one, like I said, see the real uh, cause of why people develop type one diabetes or even diabetes is not really, really understood. Once the diabetes is, is uh, like for example, there, we know what, what to do with it, how to treat it, how to control. But what triggers? I'm a normal person, let's say, and then one week from now, suddenly I'm diagnosed with diabetes. So the trigger for type 1 diabetes is clearly not known, but there are several hypotheses. For example, there is a virus. When a, when a person gets viral infection, as you all know, as normal human beings, we are exposed to viruses every day. So what virus can go inside the body and it can damage one beta cell, or one islet cell. Once it damages, the islet cell releases all contents. Now the immune system will get alert. Okay, there is something going on. The immune system can attack that beta cells and they destroy it. So people get diabetes, type 1 diabetes, because our own body destroys it. It is called an autoimmune disease. Auto means self. Immune means immune response uh, disease. So our own immune system attacks the islet cell, destroys. So the uh, maybe the virus infection, maybe there is some other genetic factors are making more and more prevalent and high number of population for type 1 diabetes. But still, we don't know uh, what causes type 1 diabetes to start. Very good. Uh, Dr. Nazirudin, you mentioned type 2, there are 90% uh, patients in the world, uh, and and type one is probably less than ten percent. So, right. do, do you see a uh, lot of uh, research happening for type two as well? Absolutely, uh, because uh, many many uh, pharmaceutical company as well as the National Institute of Health, they all want to want to control diabetes, particularly. So there is a there is a tremendous progress in treatment of diabetes, particularly type two. Like I was saying there are different types of oral medications that work through different pathways to bring the glucose down. Uh, our, our liver plays a major role in the glucose production. So there are a lot of drugs which control the liver function. You might have heard a drug called metformin. Metformin works uh, to control the liver function. Then there are certain drugs which make more insulin from in islet cells. So they are like sulfonylurea, they are called like that. So what happened? They make uh, stimulate the insulin. In fact, currently there are so many uh, uh, drugs coming into the market. Their goal is to increase more insulin production. Then the third type of drug is like, for example, when you make too much glucose in the blood, our kidney is supposed to filter the glucose, kidneys. There is a third type of drug which can open up the kidneys to flush out the glucose from blood. If the blood glucose goes more than 180, the kidney will open the gates now all the glucose will go through the urine. So that means there is no high glucose, there is no long-term complications. So for treatment of diabetes, type two diabetes, there are so many approaches. But as I was mentioning, you must take the drug every single day. You must uh, uh, follow your diet regimen. You must follow the uh, uh, exercise. All those things are there, but despite the best attempts, diabetes is a progressive disease. You cannot stop progression. You can control it. You cannot cure it. So uh, type 2 diabetes, yes, it is a major uh, focus of many, many uh, companies and research, and there's a lot of very exciting things are going on. In fact, uh, an insulin pump and attached to a glucose monitor is also, I think, uh, applicable for type 2 diabetic patients. But as the technology grows, the, the expenses are more, and it is also, there are risks associated with that. Great. Thank you for that. And speaking about the exercise, uh, next question is, if someone has uh, type 1 diabetes, is it possible if that person can come off of insulin by doing a lot of uh, physical exercises? Unfortunately not. See, the person with type 1 diabetes has no insulin. You have, you have nothing. So what you need to do is you must survive based on insulin. But one thing you can do, though, 
For example, if a type 1 diabetic patient requires 100 units of insulin, or 50, so what you can do is he, this, that patient can control the diet, do exercise. The exercise is to digest the, the food, and then that way the insulin amount can come down. But by exercise alone, uh, a, a type 1 diabetic patient cannot be free from insulin, whereas a type 2 person can. For example, I am type 2 diabetic, example. I am taking 30 units of insulin, but then from tomorrow onwards, I cut down my carbohydrate in the food, and then I also regularly use my muscles, exercise, and I, I follow a regimen, and then I am stress-free. Then, of course, I can bring the insulin requirement to zero. Type 2 has, because type 2 person makes insulin, but it is not used fully. Whereas type 1, no insulin. So you must take insulin. Uh, exercise alone won't help. Very good. Um, thank you for that. So next question, uh, Dr. Naziruddin, for you is, what has your biggest accomplishment been so far? As I was telling you, I'm very passionate about uh, our treating patients. Now, for example, I could sit in the lab, look at the cell, either cell, add tons of drugs, and then make them make more insulin less, or I can make a mouse, diabetic mouse, inject all kinds of drugs, make it work. But that's what, to be honest with you, 90% of the scientists in the world do. But for me, making a difference in a patient. For example, there was a student in Texas who was like, 16 or 18, 19 years old. And uh, because of diabetes, she was not able to go to school. She was not able to do a normal life. And once we gave the eyelets, then her, her life completely changed. She wrote a letter to the transplant surgeon, my life is completely changed. So that little satisfaction of making a difference in a patient's life is what is more important for me. So I think that I'm a little bit blessed to be in this position where we can directly uh, alter a person's lifestyle. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Naziruddin, for that. Uh, so question for the young generation. Uh, uh, what do you advise them how they can enter the field that you're in? Absolutely, like I said, you know, in this, uh, I think in the Western world, nowadays even in, in Asia, there are a lot of research labs. You know, the government is spending tons of money uh, to promote research. Uh, so, uh, if the, the thing is, if the, if the students really have the aptitude, they can really look into the institutions, like any institution, like for example, if you're in Dallas, there is a whole medical uh, center called UT Southwestern Medical Center. They are encouraging students, they call STAR program actually, S-T-A-R program. They encourage students during summer time to come to the medical school and then look into research labs. There are so many opportunities. Only thing is you need to search for it. So for young STEM students, I encourage them to look into it, particularly diabetes, you know, despite the fact that uh, for hundreds of years we have been fighting to treat this disease, there are still so many opportunities. You can still make a difference. So the students should think. And then, like I said, there is a one new field called single cell genomics. I can take a one cell in the body. Like remember, in our body, we have trillions and trillions of cells. Take one cell in the body, there is a technique by which we can say how many genes are working, not working, and things like that. So for younger generation, it is slow, so easy. For example, if you ask me to do big, big data or data analytics, I have no idea. I can't even do that. But as the younger generation, they are blessed to be in such a situation. So they can, of course, uh, uh, look for this opportunity uh, for young, you know, particularly young some students. They can, they can really join research. Excellent, uh, Dr. Naziruddin. Qu uh, question for you: Do you do you think um, this is uh, this research um, the path has to go through the medical going into the med school and then going in, going into the research, or if somebody can do undergrad and master's and PhD um, and get into this research? So, uh, what's course. your advice? For that? Yeah, see, I think if you are a doc, like if you go to medical school, then you, if you become an endocrinologist or you could become a surgeon. And then as a surgeon, you can work with the pancreas and then make sure that uh, you learn this isolation process and, and then give it to islet, to the patient. Or if you're an endocrinologist, you can look at the islet transplant patients and see, hey, how do I preserve your, your islet function? We can do that. So that's for the medical doctors. But this is not medical. The, this, uh, uh, the data that I presented today or the information clearly shows that I'm myself not an MD, I'm a PhD. So if you have a bachelor's degree in science, bachelor's in master's, master's in science, 
you can always look into the biology of uh, islet cells or biology of uh, beta cell or insulin production. You can, you can join this research even if you are not a doctor. As long as you have something to do with science, it's okay. Even if you're a high school student, like 11th grade, 12th grade, if you have a lot of interest in science, um, you know, you can look for opportunities and you can, you can make a difference. Excellent. Uh, and Dr. Uh, Naziruddin, does uh, somebody have to be a PhD to get into the lab research work or uh, you have undergrads and masters as well uh, working yeah. full time? Yeah, currently in my lab, we, we, for example, from Baylor University, when a student has already finished bachelor's, uh, they want to come for master's. We have a program where they can do master's and PhD together in my own lab. I have currently two students. Like I said, we all have limited space. We have two students who are in my lab. There are already six or seven students have finished PhD. Two, three of them are already directors. Uh, there was a person called um, Mazar Adnan Kanak. He's a, uh, from South India. He came and joined my lab, did master's, did PhD, learned the island technology. You know, he's a director in Virginia. So uh, a student who is undergraduate also can come and do in summer some work in my lab and learn more about it. When you, if you can do master's and PhD. Our lab is mostly for master's and PhD program. Very good. Yeah, do you have any uh, full-time undergrad, uh, those who have graduated from the undergrad program? The, do you have those people as well? Absolutely, you can apply. Uh, there's a Baylor University um, Institute of Medi Biomedical Studies. You, you can apply for MS and they give you a scholarship. In fact, you don't have to pay any tuition. If you, if you are qualified, if you're eligible, Currently in my lab, we have two students. They get $2,000 scholarship or more per month plus zero tuition fee. So yes, you, anybody can apply. And that's uh, Baylor University, right? All right, Baylor University. But again, there are so many programs. Like there are not only here, like UT Southwestern, and you know, in other medical schools, there are, there are always uh, opportunities in island labs. Excellent. Um, any other question from the audience? We are very blessed to have a, a speaker who is enjoying answering all these questions. Okay, we got another one. Uh, uh, we have my son's cord blood stored. Can he use his own stem cells for his eyelid transplant in the future? In sure, I would say yes, because you know the technology is growing, particularly stem cells. You might have heard there are so many companies now which are into converting See, I, I, was, I didn't uh, elaborate a lot. Uh, this, there are two types of stem cells, those who are uh, uh, from cord blood and those who are in adult cells. The cord blood stem cells have more potential. They can be cultured in the lab and then driven, or they can be uh, made into insulin producing cells. Uh, there is a lot of technology that is already working. So, but it hasn't seen the reality yet because People can see insulin production in these uh, cord blood stem cells, but there is not enough to satisfy a human being's need. For example, if you are a normal person with 70 kilograms, you need a lot of insulin. This, these stem cells are not strong enough to make that much insulin yet, but we are doing so many things. Right now, there are so many advances in genetic technology that they can use cord blood stem cells into insulin producing cells. I, I, I have a strong uh, hope that it may happen soon. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, any other question from the audience? Dr. Samiri, I think you have some question. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Nizirudin, of course, many students uh, have opportunities, but the mindset, you know, from sixth, seventh grade, how do parents prepare their kids to think in these broader terms. So what do you suggest some strategies for parents as well? Absolutely. See, uh, the thing is, uh, the, it is the information age. Anybody, like for example, they want to know uh, 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 there is a student with type 1, there is a kid with type 1, what should you do? So even parents can go into like mayoclinic.com and they have, they have beautiful uh, information toned down to very common person. As a, as a person who is not even into science, you can read those things and then get the information. If the kid is, for example, asking you a question, that you don't want me to eat too much sugar. Why? Why should I not eat more sugar? They should be able to quickly go into Google. But the problem is with Google, there are so many misleading information also. 
people may get wrong information. As long as you need to identify, okay, uh, here is an authentic website like you know Mayo or CDC, any government NIH website, and then read and tell the students, look, child, if you take sugar, this is how your body utilizes it. So curiously encourage them to think in the direction. For example, when I tell, you can ask them, well, when you eat food, it gets digested in, in like six to eight hours. What happens? Where, where is the digestion taking place? So some basic things. And then uh, apart from their school, if they come home and then encourage them to ask curious questions. And then if you're able to uh, uh, answer some simple way, that's fine. Plus also like, you know, nowadays uh, there, there are so many uh, educated scholars and teachers who are available to give answers. So get answers. Let the students ask questions. If you say, okay, my grandfather has been diagnosed with uh, some spinal cord problem. You may ask, hey, what is the spinal cord problem? What is the function? Why is it happening? Uh, can a surgery be better or not? So I think luckily uh, the information is available, but the parents have to have an aptitude also to read and tell the students what they want. Uh, increase their curiosity. That's my simple suggestion. Um, I think Dr. Uh, Professor Ahmed had, has raised his hand. Do uh, you have any question, Dr. Uh, Professor Ahmed? Yes, thank you very much. If you hear me, uh, okay, is this, yep. is this clear? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Professor. It's a very nice topic, believe me. I am a surgeon, and uh, if I understand uh, the topic good, if you give the isolate um, to the portal vein, that means you give the isolates for the pancreas again, but some of them uh, will go to the uh, liver. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, did you have any investigations or any science to see after the implant of isolat where it goes to? This is the first mm, question. And the second question, sometimes if we do an uh, surgery procedure, we have and find what we uh, uh, name exopancreatic. It's just a small one centimeter of pancreatic somewhere else. Did you have to try to implant these uh, uh, isolates for the other organic, for example, just like spleen vein or uh, in the abdomen? And uh, at least, Mr. Professor, I ask it if I can visit you in your lab because it's a very interesting topic. And thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, uh, we do brilliant questions. Since you're a surgeon, you're asking very advanced. That's very good. I don't know uh, how many people can understand. His first question is, you said you're injecting the eyelids into, uh, into portal vein. How do you know where are they going? What are they doing? Can you provide some scientific evidence? I want to tell the professor uh, that yes, uh, there is an imaging called PET imaging. You know, positive emission, some time or PET imaging. You, if you give the eyelets and then image them in the liver, you can tell where they are going. Whether they are going to the right side of the liver, left side of the lobe. Uh, uh, and, and so we have done imaging studies, not us. Actually, in Sweden, they have done. They have shown where the islets go, number one. Number two, you are asking about extra hepatics as extra pancreatic sites. Yes, there is some insulin production even in the, in the, in, in the liver, in the, sorry, in the intestine. There's a gut that there is known to be a little bit, but not a lot. So also you can put the islets in the extra pancreatic site. That is, if I can put them in the peritoneum, in the peritoneum, uh, in a rat, the islets can work fine. They can control glucose. But in a human being, uh, it is very difficult. There is a place called omentum that you can put the islet. They work fine. You can put them in the omentum, and the omentum can support the uh, uh, islet function, and the glucose can be controlled nicely. Yes, very that's good. right. That's right, Mr. Professor. We put in the uh, omentum. Yes, that's right. That's right. Uh, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, we can work so just I work to answer your third question. No. Can you visit? As I was telling, yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, you can visit the lab. Uh, uh, thank you very much. The last question, please just uh, be a patient for me. Uh, if we know that the epitic is uh, a genetics, uh, if we can uh, make uh, 
um, implant of this isolate as a prophylactic uh, for the people which have more than 40 years. Uh, and we know that we they, they will go to diabetic uh, uh, disease. Fine. And thank you very much. Okay. And, and one more question, uh, Dr. Nazuddin. Uh, which natural remedies are there for diabetes? Absolutely. Uh, actually, uh, if you go to uh, Middle Eastern countries, all the way to Asia, there are so many plant products you know, that people can, for example, um, if you uh, look at um, fenugreek, you know, fenugreek, people, what they do is they, they soak the fenugreek in the night and then they get in the morning, take the extract, and then they drink it. See, and also if you are from uh, Asia, like Pakistan, uh, people use the cinnamon powder. You know the cinnamon powder? What it does is these are all natural compounds. They have, they stimulate the islets to make more insulin. And fenugreek also makes more insulin. So yes, there are so many natural products that can really stimulate insulin production. But the problem is when you take the extract of cinnamon, uh, there are so many other things also that come with it. That, for example, some of the uh, uh, impurities in that uh, cinnamon powder can can disturb your liver function or can disturb your liver function, as a kidney function. So those are the issues. Whereas with a purified compound or a purified medicine, you know where it works, what receptor it binds. So if it's very specific, of course, there are so many natural remedies that are out there, but uh, they are not well um, studied. Got it. Got it. Very good. Okay, so we are at the bottom of the hour. Any last question from anybody? We got an excellent comment and feedback from uh, Sadi Ahmed, uh, Dr. Nazir Dinch. She's saying, thank you so much for this presentation. As a mother of a child with type 1 diabetes since she was 14 months old, I tried to keep learning about the research. This information was very beneficial. Thank you. May God give us a cure soon. So. Amen. Any last question from anybody? Okay. Well, uh, Dr. Naziruddin, um, I really enjoyed it. I hope uh, the audience also enjoyed a very, very interactive session, very detailed answers from you, um, full of energy. And um, that was the interesting part that I liked. <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, I uh, request the audience before you leave, please uh, leave us uh, with your feedback. I have uh, posted the link on Facebook as well as in the chat room in Zoom. Uh, we really need your feedback so that we can always, um, you know, uh, align and adjust our future uh, game plan and roadmap for the kind of topics and kind of uh, speakers that we want to bring on uh, through this platform for your benefit. Uh, we can align with, with what you're really looking for. And I'll end with the reminder to the audience that uh, STEM matters. Our mission is to inspire students to excel in the area of science, technology, engineering, and environment matters by nurturing their critical and analytical thinking skills. And you heard um, several times Dr. Naziruddin mentioned that we really want to sharpen the critical and an analytical thinking skills of our youth. And STEM matters our mission is to help our, our, our youth, our next generation, to really become better thinkers, better critical and analytical thinkers. Uh, we coach and mentor middle and high schoolers, and we prepare them for the national and international STEM competitions. Uh, we'll be opening up registration for the spring uh, 2021 session um, next month. Um, so please keep, uh, uh, look for our information on, uh, on the website. STEMmatters.org, S-T-E-M-A-T-T-E-R-S.org. Uh, we look forward to have uh, another batch of young students who will join us hopefully, and we will help them sharpen their um, STEM skills. And um, with that, um, Dr. Nazirudin, you want to say any uh, one last thing uh, to wrap up? Absolutely. Actually, yeah, again, I want to thank the, the opportunity to present work. But I am more happy because a lot of people were able to ask questions. That is very important. The entire uh, purpose is to to uh, to actually uh, encourage students to uh, actually to tickle their curiosity. Can they become curious? Can they ask questions? And uh, so that is the important thing. So I, I I'm really happy that we have like around 20-25 minutes of discussion, and that's really the important thing. 
So with that, thank you, Dr. Naziruddin, and thank you, audience, for joining us. Um, have a good, blessed rest of the day or evening, wherever you are. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Naziruddin. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.